Good morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is at the center, welcome to worship on our anniversary Sunday. I'm uh, the Reverend Catherine McDonald, and our, we've got a special guest speaker this morning, uh, Wendy Fraser from the North Grove. She'll be introduced more fully later on. And uh, Dunnery Bond is our uh, special guest musician. Our music director is Byron Herman, <clears throat> and our reader today is Nellie Clake. We are celebrating 108 years of ministry at Stairs Memorial. And not only do we have guest speaker and guest musician, but we also are celebrating a baptism. What a wonderful day to celebrate a baptism. To those of you who are joining us on Zoom or Facebook Live, as well as those of you who may be joining or viewing the, the broadcast later on, I love to know where people are. And if you want to add a word to our gratitude uh, pumpkin, uh, please uh, make a comment and I will add it later on. I do check those comments later on during the week. As we gather in this place, we are mindful that in Nova Scotia, we gather on unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And so may we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. Let us sing, just remain seated and sing together. Spirit, open my heart. We light the candle as a symbol of the light that came into the world in creation. We light it as a symbol of the light that was more fully revealed in Jesus Christ. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will never overcome it. Let us join together in the call to worship that is printed responsively in the order of worship and on the screens. Are you hungry today? Are you thirsty today? You have come to the place where we gather together in honesty and humility to encounter the living God. And let us pray. God of many blessings, we give thanks to you for having fed us, sustained us, and challenged us with the waters of creation journey. We pray that this food will sustain us as we go from this place to be your people. We pray for food enough, enough to sustain all the people. We turn to you, knowing that you understand us. Forgive us and love us like a mother, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or rise in spirit as we sing our opening hymn, Let Us Build a House. In a moment, you're going to need your baptismal insert, and it will also be up on the screen. Baptism celebrates God's initiative and our response. It's God's yes to us and our yes to God. Baptism flows from God's unmerited grace and pours out in lives of gratitude and commitment.
As initiationists, it's an the covenant of baptism celebrates the fullness of God's grace throughout the story of salvation. In creation and in exodus, in wilderness and exile, in birth and in death. In his baptism, Jesus himself repentance and forgiveness and marked a new beginning in his ministry. In our baptism, we are similarly called. Our baptismal identity is both individual and communal. It honors the diversity of individuals and challenges us to be a community of equals. As Paul wrote, as many of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ, now there is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for you are all one. Jesus. I invite you to stand as we sing our baptismal hymn, Child of Blessing, Child of Promise. And I would invite those who are participating in the baptism to come and stand along here during the singing of the fourth verse. be seated and now you will need to insert or to take a look up on the screens and your responses are in bold and there's some for the just for the parents and there's some just for the godparents sisters and brothers the sacrament of baptism proclaims and celebrates the grace of God Christ united with one I asked you these questions so that we might know your mind and heart. And if you'd like to take off your masks, you can. I'm guessing you've been in the same household together. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe in God's source of love? In Jesus Christ, God's love made human, and in the Holy Spirit, the power of God's love. We do, by the grace of God. Trusting the gracious mercy of God, will you turn from the forces of evil and renounce their power? 
the will of God be in our helper. Will you follow the way of Jesus Christ? The will of God be in our helper. Will you join with your brothers and sisters in this community of faith to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, and love and serve others? The will of God be in our helper. In baptism, you mark an important step in your faith journey. Do you promise to share your faith as a family, attend worship, pray, and encourage one another to continually, continually grow in faith? And when the time is right, encourage Delilah to reconfirm these promises. We will, God, be our helper. Recognizing that many persons nurture and influence the life of a child, Will you, Tyler, and you, Nicole, as Delilah's godparents, support this family as they grow in faith? Do you folks gathered here as members of Stairs Memorial United Church, do you promise to assist in the Christian faith formation of this family as they seek the spiritual guidance and nurture of this church by providing the learning resources, leadership, and opportunities? Gracious and holy God, we bless you for the gift of life and within it the gift of water. Through waters of the Exodus, you led the children of Israel to freedom. Jesus began his public ministry proclaiming the good news of your love and forgiveness, healing, reconciling, and revealing your love in all of its fullness. of the risen Christ in the world.
Um, is, uh, well, our vision is a thriving community and our mission is to create a supportive uh, space for learning and community connections to form and grow. So we often, all of our programs um, are around food and we often say that, you know, the output is food and, and helping to manage um, a serious hidden hunger problem, but the outcome is connection. Uh, and really, um, what we know is in, in Dartmouth North in particular, you know, in the area kind of bounded by, um, or bounded by Highfield Park um, and Albro Lake, uh, going up to Albro Lake, um, there is a significant amount of people living in, um, in, in quite significant isolation. Um, and in mixed poverty. Uh, it's, an, it's a fascinating community. Many of you m may be from it. It's um, probably, uh, I've worked in not-for-profits for longer than I want to say, uh, 40 years, and um, it is the most resilient community I've ever been a part of. It is um, a connected community, it's an incredibly diverse community. There are people living there who live in poverty and who were raised in poverty. There are people who are there because they may have um, struggled with de a dependence of some sort, some health issues, some mental health issues. And there are people there who worked long, long careers. Uh, you know, one of uh, uh, our regular volunteers and participants worked at one of the big chain hotels for her whole career, baking. Um, uh, but of course, there were no pensions connected with those kind of jobs. So then in retirement, people are living in somewhat reduced circumstances and somewhat isolated. Um, just to give you a couple of stats about our community, so I'm not speaking about the entire um, uh, community of Dartmouth North, but more about the community of North Grove. Um, and uh, in, in our community, 84% um, of our participants are living on low income. 58% uh, are lone, or, uh, lone, family, lone parent or lone family households. 49% um, uh, of all residents in Dartmouth North live alone. 82% um, live in rental units. 84% say food insecurity is having a negative impact on their physical health. And 97% uh, feel that they have a sense of belonging at the North Grove. So um, I will try to quickly give you a 26-year history of our work in the community. Um, we started out as Dartmouth uh, Family Center, Dartmouth Family and Resource Center originally, uh, nearly 27 years ago, trying to support um, mostly young families um, in developing parenting skills and having ways to connect. Um, if you're living in some poverty, then the idea that you're going to have a babysitter come in so you can have a little bit of a break or that you're going to go to a variety of you know classes for moms around town becomes much more challenging and when you bring people together uh, you know we often say we just provide the space the magic happens from the people who come there and so very often families then start supporting each other um, and we really saw it during COVID that families who'd met and connected in our family programs stayed connected throughout COVID. They helped one another and, and really managed some of that social isolation and support. You know, at the very beginning, you probably remember, you couldn't take your children into the grocery store. So if you were a single parent, it was very challenging to even get a hold of food. Um, so, you know, when, it, when we were in business for about 25 years doing child development programming um, and parenting programming, and in the middle of that, um, kind of, by accident, we became aware of the level of hidden hunger in that particular part of the community. And it happened because people used to come into our old family center, which, uh, which was on Albro Lake, and they would come to maybe fax something. Fax, it sounds so ancient already now. Uh, to, to fax something or find out the bus schedule or maybe just do a crossword and have a little time with people. Um, and there was a recognition that people were hungry. So first they started putting out snacks, and then they started putting out um, crock pots of food. And within an hour, the crock pot was gone. So then it started being two crock pots and then three crock pots. And the, the, what became apparent was how many people were prioritizing rent over food. Um, and we know, you know, this was kind of prior to the, the crisis we're in now with housing but it's very hard to afford both um, when you're living on a fixed income. 
So from that, we, we then connected with uh, Community Food Centers Canada. And there's some uh, brochures at the back if you want to learn some more information about the programs we put on. Um, and Community Food Center Canada, in a nutshell, is entirely different from other kinds of food programs. So it's not a food bank, and it's not a soup kitchen. And there's, there's a real place for both of those in our community. But really what this was about was about bringing people together over food skills and and sharing food. So in normal times, because COVID has been nothing but abnormal, um, we have about 100 volunteers a week. And those volunteers may be from anywhere within the community or they may be participants. Um, and uh, they help prepare the meals. We have a 20,000 square foot farm and everything that we grow on the farm, we give out during the summer and we have a, a weekly market or we put into the food that we serve. And so we have community meals three times a week. Um, we have food skills programs where people come in, learn how to make, I don't know, chili. Um, they get all the ingredients for chili because some of the things you don't think about in terms of poverty is how expensive spices are. And if you're living on a fixed income, just affording to get chili spices can be a challenge. So they learn how to do it. It's a little bit for, I'll age myself, but for those of you who remember the galloping gourmet, it's a little bit like that. We have a staff with a little microphone on and she uh, teaches everybody how to cook a certain meal. And then everybody gets to share in that meal and then they get to take home all the ingredients and cook it at home. So it makes sure that in that skill development and connection, people get three meals as well. So it's a very important part without it being just about giving out food. It's really about bringing people together and connecting over food. So we do the same with our child development programs. There's always snacks and food that go home. Um, during COVID, of course, you know, well, as I said, a connection was what we do. Um, we couldn't. So we really still needed to make sure that people were fed. Um, and I have to say that uh, I have the best staff team in the world. Um, and they, within six days of, of the world shutting down March 9th, uh, 2020, um, we had reconfigured ourselves to be a food distribution team. Um, and during that time, in the year between the beginning of COVID and, and the end of March, um, we uh, distributed 23,356 meals. All of those meals were double meals so that people could have at least enough um, for two meals from it, and we did that twice a week. Um, we uh, put out 12,400 produce packs, 4,200 home visits and calls, and um, uh, 2,100 calls for our community action office. Then our community action office, we have something called uh, peer support where people get trained to be able to support their neighbors to get help working with their workers or with their landlords or whatever, that it doesn't need, they don't need to kind of go to a social worker for that. They can actually do that peer to peer. So we make sure the peers are trained to do that. Um, and then they provide that support. So we also became quite the, uh, as I see that you have done, um, we became very, uh, well, I did not, but some of my staff became very tech savvy uh, through this time. And so we did a lot of video as well. We did a lot of programming and cooking groups through, uh, through video. Um, I'm really pleased to say that we've been back uh, in person for four months now at reduced numbers um, and being careful about bringing people back together. Uh, so, you know, just to tell you quickly, um, in terms of, you know, the other things about the community is it's a very diverse community, um, both in age and in circumstance, but also over the years becoming increasingly uh, diverse. A lot of people, we've seen a real increase, um, particularly from the original Syrian refugee, um, you know, kind of... A, Influx, I was going to say, which sounds like it's over, but it was really uh, it was a lovely amount of people who came. But a, a lot of people were sponsored for a year and then needed to find other housing. And unfortunately, often were in uh, low paying jobs. So Dartmouth North has become, I mean, the benefit is it's become incredibly uh, diverse. And our farm has become incredibly diverse as a result. Uh, part of our farm, we, we grow food and we distribute food, but we also have boxes that people can use over the summer. They can learn how to farm if they want, or they can 
grow whatever they want if they know how to. So it's been really amazing to see the different things that people are growing um, and teaching us about foods that you know they can't find in Canada um, that are staples are all of a sudden growing in our farm and it's, uh, it's a really lovely thing to see. Um, so, uh, you know, as I, I, I really said, it's been, um, it's been a difficult time, but it's been a time of really recognizing how important we were. Um, the, not just our parents, but also we have a significant seniors population who also really took care of each other during COVID. So people would come and say, you know, I need 10 meals um, because there's three seniors in my building who can't get out at all and we need to make sure that they're fed. So COVID was a challenge and it's been a significant challenge for us and for the community, but it's also been a real gift in a way. Um, and the gift has been the recognition of how people support one another and how much people give to one another. Uh, we've had numbers of people come back and say that they you know, have felt really, really stressed th throughout this time. We had four uh, people who became sick with COVID during the time and two of them unfortunately passed away. Um, but at the same time, people felt that the connections that they had originally made through the North Grove really helped to sustain them throughout this time. Um, so if you're you know, ever interested in coming in and, and looking, we have uh, our food center, which looks like a big, beautiful um, restaurant. Uh, it's kind of a free food restaurant. You know, one of the things that we often talk about is that if we want to connect, we can go to Tim Hortons and have a coffee and have a chat. But when you're living in poverty, those kind of things can be out of reach. So the North Grove tries very hard to be that. People can come, they can connect. We, in normal times, we have morning breakfast, we have meals, and people can just be with their friends and have time together, or they can volunteer and connect. So if you're interested in a tour, please, please come along. Um, and if you're interested in volunteering, you can check into our website. Um, there's ways to volunteer as well. And uh, you know, if anybody has any questions, um, certainly I'll be here for a little bit, but also feel free to reach out to us there. Um, I'd be happy to tell you more about it. If I stay with my 10 minutes, very much. <laughs> you didn't get the hook. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, thank you so much, Wendy. On, on behalf of Stairs Memorial United Church, I, I called Wendy up during COVID, actually, and uh, she gave me a tour of the facility, even though it wasn't fully operational at the time, but I did get some sense of, uh, of its impact on the community. And so on behalf of Stairs, we thank you so much thank for coming and wish you blessings on your work. Thank you very much. <clears throat> This morning's Minute for Reconciliation is about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. <clears throat> the United Church operated 15 schools within the Indian residential school system. These schools accounted for 10% of all the children within that system. This was part of a larger plan to assimilate Indigenous people and weaken their communities. Children were regularly rounded up 
and families were sanctioned if they didn't comply with the system. The last of the United Church's schools closed in 1969. The United Church acknowledges that our role in the residential school system and colonization is an abuse of power within or through our Christian faith. This abuse took many forms and was often brutal, and the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement led to the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Many children died at residential schools, and this year the unmarked graves of 1,898 Indigenous children were found at sites of former residential schools. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission tells us the path towards reconciliation is the path towards justice. There are many passages in our Bible that remind us how important it is to seek justice. But this time, we need to listen before we act and to support Indigenous people when they tell us what they need. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, issued many calls to action. One of the calls for the church was to respond. Uh, the United Church has chosen to do that. One way is by creating the heal healing fund through the mission and service. Um, so one way for our congregation to support that is to make contributions to the healing fund. So this fall, we're trying to raise $1,898 uh, to contribute to the healing fund. If you'd like to participate, we have orange envelopes at the back of the church um, that you can use to make your donation. Thank you. Thank you, LJ. Let us come together as a community of faith in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we celebrate 108 years of ministry of stairs. Years of prayer and service and work and worship. Years of feeding people and working alongside them. Years of connecting with others in the community. For we know, O oh God, that we do not have the monopoly on your work. Your work takes place all over the place. This morning we pray especially for those who are hungry and thirsty. May they be fed with good and nourishing food and fed with justice and with healing. We pray for Delilah and Cooper and their family as they make this mark this new beginning in their life together the delight of a celebration on, on an anniversary. We pray for the lonely. We pray for those who mourn the death of a loved one, whether that is recently or long ago. We pray for those who are caught up in the justice system. We pray for those who struggle with mental health issues. And we pray for ourselves that we might be called and claimed and commissioned by Jesus into his life and ministry and energized for that work by the Holy Spirit. And we gather all of these prayers together. And all God's people say it. Amen. So just a few pieces of announcements before. I think there's cake downstairs today, too. There's not always cake, but I think there's cake downstairs. Um, <laughs> Cooper's ready to get downstairs right away, right? <laughs> um, a couple of things for next week. 
Um, so next week is going to be our All Saints Sunday. So if you have somebody that you'd like to remember, whether that death has been recently in the last year or long ago, if you could get their name and a picture to the office by Tuesday, that would be great so that we could include that. The other thing is after worship next Sunday, right after worship, like stay in your seats, there's going to be a presentation from the transition team and executive about the next steps in our interim ministry journey. So it would be really great to have folks there. And I know I see the Reverend Dr. Susan McAlpine Gillis here, and I know that she would like to speak for a few minutes. And then I know that Janet McLean is going to speak for a few minutes. So Janet, if you could maybe move up to the front to be ready. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, yes, my name is Susan McAlpine Gillis, and I am very fortunate to be uh, associate uh, professor of pastoral theology at Atlantic School of Theology. And one of my roles there is to work with all of our students who are involved in supervised field education. And so on behalf of Atlantic School of Theology, I want to thank all of you and the Reverend Catherine McDonald for the support that you have offered over many years to students at AST. And in particular, to thank you for the work that you are currently doing with your student minister, Jesse Crabtree. Atlantic School of Theology could not do the work that we do in forming students for ministry if it were not for congregations like STAIRS who welcome students, take them under their wing, offer time and input and help to form them. So I noticed an announcement in your bulletin and on your screen about one of Jesse's focuses is around uh, pastoral skills. So um, please continue to support her in that way. In the winter term, she'll be doing an educational project. Of course, she'll need participants for that. So just a, just a huge thank you for all the work you do. Another hat that I have worn for a long time within the region is work in the area of pastoral relations. And I simply want to say what a joy it has been to serve on the transition team, um, working with STAIRS as it charts its way forward. I'm sorry that I'm not going to be able to be with you uh, next Sunday. I'd love to be here for the congregational conversation around how things are moving. But I want to say thank you for the gift that it's been to serve uh, and to continue to serve on the transition team. And although it's maybe not my place, I'm still going to say it. On behalf of the region, I want to thank Catherine for the gift that she brings to you in interim ministry, for the gift that you offered her on sabbatical, for the kind of renewed energy that she has come with um, to take you through the next steps as you make those decisions. So please know that uh, my thoughts, my prayers continue to be with STAIRS, uh, with the transition team, with the, uh, with the leadership of this congregation as you step boldly into the future. So for both of those things, um, God's blessing be upon you. Thank you, Susan. The COVID dance, yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Janet McLean, and I'm a member of the COVID team here at Stairs, along with our chair, Jim Bald, uh, Betty Kemp, Sandra Jameson, and Reverend Catherine. Um, and Cooper, I hope I won't take very long so you can get down and get some cake. <laughs> Just a few, a couple of important changes coming up that we just want Janet, the mic. Just a few, is that better? What? Eat it. <laughs> okay. There. All right. Um, so just a couple of protocol changes or practice changes that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, some of it's been in the announcements that you've had, uh, either received by mail or in your emails, but we thought a little verbal would also help. So COVID-19 has challenged us all in different ways, and as Wendy said, it's also been a time of clarity for finding out and really appreciating some of the things that we do best. Um, at STAIRS, all of our 
protocols and practices have from day one been based on recommendations, mandates, and uh, public health practices issued by the province of Nova Scotia and Health Canada. And so now we're into the phase of living with COVID, so a few more changes. Um, another thing, just to let you know, one of the other um, inputs that we've had regularly is from um, Dr. Faith, uh, Reverend Faith March McGuish, who is the Executive Minister of Regional um, District 15 for the United Church of Canada, and she is in regular contact direct contact with Dr. Strang and so has been able to guide us in some of the specific applications for here. So number one, right now this is the last week you will have to pre-register online. So to come to church next Sunday you will not get a notification in your email that says please register for church next week. Anyway. <laughs> Um, what we're going to do, we still are required to have some attendance and a contact information for those who are participating in service just in case it's needed for contact tracing by public health. So we will simply have a contact sheet where when you come in, you'll sign your name and your phone number and then you'll make your way into the service. Um, there will be a worship host available in the entryway. If you need a little help with that, no problem. Um, it is expected that everyone will be taking responsibility for uh, complying with any public health uh, initiatives in the community and with regards to travel, exposure, and testing, etc. We won't be ans asking the questions at the door. We will have a sign there to remind you, but that's it. We may go to pre-registration for some some services now and then if we feel we need to kind of have a handle on seating such i don't know if it would be something like christmas or a special occasion service or something like that but that would be communicated ahead of time and before i finish with um pre-registration just really want to thank joanne thornton and sandra jameson for having conducted all of the pre-registrations -pre over these last many months The second big change is proof of full vaccination at stairs. So this has been an issue of discussion at many levels in the community and certainly here in the church. Um, the Nova Scotia COVID-19 proof of vaccination protocol has actually been in effect since October 4 um, and is not required for essential and non-discretionary services uh, and activities. This means here in, in this building, uh, proof of vaccination is not required at regular faith services um, and from those volunteering at or receiving food bank services. All other activities being held in the church require proof of vaccination. vaccination. And I'm not gonna repeat the full list, but those were in um, the bulletin and online as well. Um, so, Next week, one of the things on that list is uh, the fellowship uh, section at, uh, activity after service. Beginning next week, in order to attend that fellowship, you will need to provide proof of vaccination. And as well for meetings or uh, discussions being held after service, proof of vaccination will be required. So if you're staying following service, we'll need to gather that information. So, um, the, and another question that some are having is that if there are church groups, small church groups such as Bible study that would be taking place in someone's home, those are come, come under um, informal gatherings and are not subject to proof of vaccination, but you need to uh, maintain the gathering limits of 25 that are uh, asked by the province. How do you provide proof of full vaccination? It can be a paper copy, it can be a photocopy, it can be a, a screenshot on your phone, it can be the digital um, uh, representation on your phone, um, and we will, but we will not be um, uh, using a scanner here. So we need to kind of see your, your copy. Or, and many of you have the little laminated cards. Yes, we can use that. 
ID will be required for those we don't know, as in we can't identify, you know, are you the person holding the card? We, and as I said, we won't be using scanners. If it's a regular group with the same people attending, then proof of vaccine can be obtained once and doesn't have to be provided every time you uh, ad attend that group. We're putting, in, uh, we're putting a way in place to gather that information and record that status on a list for future reference. And this could be referred to for multiple groups and activities to help make things as convenient as possible. Um, vaccination, is cons vaccination records are considered private health information. And as such, we require your consent to add that to a list um, as such by the province of Nova Scotia under the privacy and confidentiality protocols. So the, um, we have, the province has issued a uh, consent sheet for that reason and we'll have those available. And starting next Sunday, following church, I think Sandra and I are going to be, whether we're going to be in the area where the back chairs are or the entryway, we're not sure, um, to, for anyone who wishes to present their uh, proof of vaccination for the purpose of having it added to a list that could be utilized only here in stairs. Information cannot and will not be shared in any other circumstance other than activities related to this church. And, um, and we can have that added to the list. Now that list will be collated in the uh, church office um, and it's really only gonna be added names added into it once a week. So it's still a good idea to have your proof of vaccination in your pocket, uh, just in case. Um, next Sunday won't be the only time that you can um, sign on for the consent. We hope to have that opportunity available in the church office on Mondays from 9 to 3, if you wish to just uh, come on your own to do that. And we'll probably do some sign up, like after church for a few weeks yet and also chairs and leaders of the activities and, and groups here at the church would be able to collect that information as well. Um, if none of these opportunities work well for you, please speak to one of us and we will help you do that if this is something you'd like to do. Um, so uh, I think that that is about it. We're hoping that in the uh, announcements, in the uh, electronic announcements this week, We'll add a copy of the consent so you can have a look at it and with more details for next week. So thank you very much. I'm getting the hook. <laughs> You're getting the hook. <laughs> thank you, Janet. Um, the COVID team has been amazing throughout this whole process. Uh, Paul, we're skipping the last hymn. <laughs> Go out into the world knowing that God loves you Go out into the world with a hunger and a thirst for justice. Go out into the world knowing that you are enough for what God has planned. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and always. Amen. Our song of dismissal will be up on the screen. joy and pain of living as you love